Welcome to Draconic's webinar entitled Genetic Variation in Outbred Stocks of Mice and Rats, which will be presented today by Dr. Gerald Bote, our senior scientist in the R&D department. My name is Margit Wissenbach and I will be your moderator today. Before we get started, I'd like to address a few practical matters. This webinar will be made available to all attendees. We will email a link for the presentation to you as soon as possible. Directly after this presentation, Dr. Borte will answer questions as they appear in the control panel. So if you have a question, please type it in the control panel. Don't be shy, any question is a good question. The other attendees will not be able to see your question as it is sent directly to Dr. Borte and me. If you cannot see the control panel, just single click on the single arrow on the top of your screen. In case a question is not answered at the end of today's session, Dr. Porter will respond to you within the next 24 hours by email. If you're experiencing technical difficulties, please send the host a chat message and our staff will be able to assist you. Dr. Gerald Porter holds a PhD and spent his postdoctoral fellowship at New York University. He then worked at Lexicon Genetics in the field of gene targeting. At Draconic, he has been working for over 10 years in the area of mouse behavior, genetics, and the development of PCR assays for gene mutations and mouse pathogens. In this webinar today, Dr. Bode will describe our outbred stocks, their maintenance and genetic monitoring, and their application in research. Just like natural populations, outbred mice and rats have a high degree of genetic variation. Many of their genes are so heterozygous in a heterozygous state. However, this variation is well controlled so that meaningful experiments can be performed. So let's get started. We hope you will enjoy today's webinar with the title Genetic Variation in Outbred Stocks of Mice and Rats. And with these words, I would like to hand over the word to Dr. Bode, please. Dr. Bode? Yeah, thank you. And I'll say good morning to everybody and want to just go right ahead and start with this talk about genetic variation in outbred stocks of mice and rats. So I wanted to talk about some general points about outbred stocks and also what results we got when we analyzed the genetic variation in our taconic outbred stocks of mice and rats. So first I wanted to mention that uh, this is of course a collective effort of many people at Taconic, including the Taconic Genetics Group with Anna Perez and Paige Hinchy, Taconic R&D with Jan Gray, and also Molecular Analysis Group with Kim Malinex, Rebecca Farinacci, Jamie Rusconi, and Steve Festen. So, but going to genetics, in life science experiments, what do we need genetics for? In, couldn't we just look at the physiology, for example, of an animal? Unfortunately, that's not that easy because all the animals are different and therefore the physiology of the animals is also different. So therefore, you not only look at the genetics of an, experiment, of an animal if you are in genetics, if you are doing direct genetics research, but you are also looking at the genetics of an animal or are confronted with it or confused by it if you uh, run an experiment on any other topic. So the genetic variation can be both the basis of your experiment and a confounding factor. And of course there's about 25,000 different genes in mice and depending on what type of mouse you have, these genes will have, diff <coughs> have different alleles, of which only a couple are visible. Of course, this is a white mouse, this is an agouti mouse, this is a black mouse that has no hair. So that's easy to see, but there is uh, 24,997 other genes involved in this. And a they all may have a small influence on the physiology and the behavior and all the other part factors. 
uh, all, all the other properties or phenotypes of a mouse. Therefore, you could say a mouse is not a mouse is not a mouse, and that was actually the title of the previous talk that I gave about a month ago, and that's still at, on the Taconic website. So there is a lot of points I'm not going to talk about in this uh, talk today. Uh, generally, you can say that genetic ge standardization by inbreeding is good, but many experiments require a closer approximation of natural populations. And a point that I'm not making today is that bacteria and pathogens also have genes. That's another story I talked about this earlier. <clears throat> now, if we look at natural populations, that is what we want to approximate in most experiments. We want to look at a phenomenon that is there in nature. Natural populations are messy. We have a var varying and undefined symbionts and pathogens. We have subpopulations and sub subpopulations. So there is a substructure in the populations of a species, for example, mice. It's unlikely that a mouse that lives in, say, uh, New York City will mate with a mouse that lives in Boston. Although through the interconnecting populations, there is a small amount of gene flow that connects all these. Then we have selective pressure, for example, in, in, the, in a wild house mouse, house mouse living in your basement. The selective pressure is, for example, uh, poison and traps that have a strong pressure on uh, the liver enzymes and the uh, and the behaviors that the mouse has. Then there's random genetic drift. We have migration. The mice move from one a place to another. There is new mutations. So, of course, you can this all applies not only to mice, but also to all other mammals. For example, e even with jet travel, there is still subpopulations in the human species, so which means it's less likely for somebody in New York City to marry somebody who lives in Siberia than it's for that person to marry somebody who lives in Yonkers. And so, the new mutations also apply to all mammals. There is a, a new mutation rate of about 10 to the minus 8 per generation, both in mice and in humans. Then we have phenomena like overdominance. That is, a heterozygote is fitter than either homozygote. And this also depends on the interaction with the environment. So for for example, the if you have in the human hemoglobin, there is a locus. Uh, that's a locus where you have one mutation, sickle cell anemia that makes people resistant to malaria. So the person heterozygous to sickle cell anemia is fitter than the homozygous for both sickle cell anemia and wild type alleles. And there are many other. Uh, examples like that. Uh, then, in all natural populations, heterozygotes are abundant, and fitness varies according to circumstances. So, heterozygotes abundant means that in every natural mammalian population, there are millions of SNPs that differ between individuals. So. This is all very difficult to analyze and very, it looks very messy, but this is life and human populations are just like that. So if you want to know anything about the details or the phenomena behind human disease, then we need to look at these phenomena as well. We can't only look at uh, research models that are completely, completely homozygous. And one possibility of getting such uh, 
research models that simulate natural populations are outbred stocks of research animals, for example, rats and mice. So the steps to good experiments are generally we first control the pathogens, which I talked about in the previous talk. We control symbionts, for example, the bacteria in the gut, which also was in the previous talk. We use inbred strains where appropriate. But in many areas, we don't want to have too much uniformity between the animals. So, and we can make experiments in those cases by controlling and adjusting the genetic variation of the experimental animal itself. So if we look at gen genetic variation, we control for variation in pathogens and symbionts, and we Think about which experiments we can address using completely homogeneous animals. These would be the inbred strains and related strains, like congenics or recombinant inbreds. And these have been bred by over 20 generations or more. But the genetic makeup, as I said, is fairly unnatural because they are homozygous in nearly all loci. You can calculate that an inbred mouse is heterozygous only in a couple of hundred loci that were introduced a few generations ago through mutation. So the more natural model is an outbred stock. So how do we go about creating an outbred stock? We start with a genetically diverse population, for example, of mice, also rats. Theoretically, you can have that in any species, only it becomes more and more costly the larger the animals get. And the increase in cost for um, outbred stocks is larger than for inbred strains because you need so many animals to maintain them. We maintain the genetic diversity by rotational breeding of hundreds of animals. With rotational breeding, and I will get back to that later in the talk at the end, means uh, dividing the population of animals up into a number of groups, say four or eight or even more, and then choosing the breeders in the next generation by using a male and a female from different groups in each generation. And that avoids that related animals are bred and that reduces inbreeding. We avoid genetic drift by large population size, as mentioned, and also no selection. So if we create the original outbred population, there should be no selection. The only selection that is unavoidable, of course, is for fertility, because if the mouse doesn't breed, then it can't be uh, putting its uh, genetic material into the next generation. But all other selection should be avoided. Resulting populations will maintain diversity in multitude of haplotypes, that is, typical of natural populations, and they avoid the calves. Because now it's all one homogeneous population, you have no subpopulations, you close this stock so there's no migration, and so on. All these things are much better controlled in a natural population. The uses of these are toxicology, for example, all classical toxicology, kill experiments that test whether a drug is suitable to go on in the drug development process are done in large populations of mice and rats, often rats, and pharmaceutical companies have a very large treasure trove of uh, data on the 
toxicology of different compounds that they have tested in the past. So the medicinal chemists can also predict from that which uh, candidates are better for further development. Uh, then another interesting area is the selection of phenotypes. So for example, if you want to uh, find out which genes are or which processes are involved in alcoholism, you would uh, make a selection experiment where you have a large output population. You then do a behavior test, consumption of alcohol, and then choose the animals that consume more than average in that population, and you select another group that where the animals select uh, drink less than the average population. And then you go on breeding those two groups for another generation, and you again do a selection, exp selection where you again choose the drinkers in the one case and the non-drinkers in the other case, and so on, that you create therefore two selected populations that differ only in the genes that influence alcohol consumption. So there is, of course, also another very practical approach to using outbred stocks, and that is all the support functions in your maintenance of inbred stocks, transgenics, and breeding should be done with outbred mice because, or outbred rats because they breed better. So here it's a very practical thing if you need foster a foster mother for an inbred transgenic, then you use best an outbred stock that breed, breeds well and has a good uh, behavior towards pups. And then you, the other, the only other thing you, that you want to have is you want to have the right um, coat color to be able to call everything apart. And in that case, you only need breeding performance. You don't need carefully selected uh, genetic diversity in these things. So in the real world, I wanted to talk first about outbred mice and how they came about. So there's a fairly interesting story about this. Most outbred mouse stocks were derived from nine mice that were shipped from Lausanne, Switzerland uh, to the USA in 1926. So here the population history is completely known. And of course we want to know once they arrived in the new world, how has this population fared in the breeding colonies? Has it been possible to maintain genetic diversity in that stock? So this is nine different animals. Each has two chromosomes. So theoretically in each there, there could be uh, eight 18 different alleles in any one gene, and lots of SNPs be preserved in a small population like this, provided that once they arrived in the US, they were expanded quickly into a large population. If they would have been bred ongoing only in three or four pairs, then the genetic diversity would have gone down very much every generation. So, and also now these Swiss mice have been used for uh, many purposes, and often a new mutation was uh, found in those in one of those stocks or outside one of those stocks in an inbred line, and then the new mutation was transferred into the Swiss mouse stock. Now the question is how did people do that? Uh, be, because if you don't do it right, then the genetic variation in the stock that now has the mutation goes down a lot. Uh, so we studied this in our Swiss Webster and other, trans uh, and other outbred stocks. And 
we looked at the following main parameters. So first is heterozygosity. So for example, if we have four animals that have the genotypes AA, AB, AB, and BB, then heterozygosity is 0 0.5. Gene frequency is also 0 0.5 for each allele. And they usually express this in genetics like with P equals 0.5 and Q equals 0.5. In four animals with AA, 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 and AB, heterozygosity is only 0.25. And P, the uh, frequency of the major allele, is 0.875 because the allele frequency is man, uh, measured over all alleles, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight alleles in four animals, because each one has two chromosomes. Only one of them is B, so that's one eighth. Other parameters one can look at is number of polymorphisms. There can be many rare polymorphisms, and heterozygosity is still low. And also, one could look at linkage and at haplotypes, although the resolution that of our panels were, was a bit low to look at that. If the genetic diversity of the original population is known or can be estimated, then we can also calculate the, the average effective population side. And that's something I'm going into more detail later. So the methods we used was, in the mice, we used the commercially available 1449 SNP panels. The technology details are in the next slides. We used at least 20 mice from each stock and sampled the tails, simple tail clips, extracted the DNA and then tested. We used two samples from each inbred strain. That's enough because the inbred strains are nearly completely homozygous. Then we excluded failed markers from the calculation and calculated heterozygosity and polymorphic markers. And we estimated the heterozygosity in Swiss founder population by combining all polymorphisms found in outbred stocks and Swiss-derived inbred strains. So here's a little bit on the technology. So what we you do here, this is an Illumina technology. We isolate genomic DNA first, put it on a solid support, then add, and that solid support is in this first step only to make it easier to purify. And then we put in primers, and this is allele-specific extension primers and locus-specific primers that are the same for both alleles. So in this case, the T primer, primer 2 binds because the genomic DNA has an A here. Then this is extended by DNA polymerase and linked by ligase to the other strand that also bound. Then we do PCR with universal primers. So here is a universal primers for type one, type two, and for the and a common primer on the other side. And what the uh, locus primer also contains is a kind of an address label that is shown here. And that is later used to hybridize the DNA to another type of beads that has a fluorescent uh, marker here so that one can read it in, uh, with lasers. And it has a, the address or the locus type, the locus identifier here as a DNA sequence. The, my PCR product binds to it, and now we get a fluorescent. We know on the fluorescent bead is a green 
of locus number 1102, for example, there is a green, two green fluorescence labels on there. There's no red. Then it would be called as intent, the one, one of the allele types, or it's both red, then it would be homozygous, the other type, or it's heterozygous. And the readout of this, the graphical representation of the readout is something like this where I have the intensity of allele A, fluorescence on one axis, the intensity of the other allele on the second axis, and then each point here is one sample and one marker. So that means for the 1449 marker panel, we have 1449 of such graphs in the computer. Now the computer software calls groups those dots of fluorescence into two homozygous and one heterozygous cluster. And one can also adjust those clusters if they don't look right. So the density or the coverage and resolution of this panel is very good. Here's a graphical representation of the position in million base pair on the y-axis and each one chromosome on the x-axis for that, one can see that there's no, nearly no large gaps, except here is a small gap, for example. So the results as an overview are shown in this picture here. So if we now look at all lab mice, that would be the data from inbred strains also. And we look at all the inbred strains that have been analyzed with this panel. And the, we look at the outbred strains and so on. And uh, think about if we mix this all together in a hypothetical population, then the heterozygosity of that would be around 0.35. We found 1,401 markers in this panel that gave results throughout all populations. That means that 48 markers didn't work. And the reason for that is usually that in the markers were originally developed for looking at B6 mice. And now if there is any additional mutation close to the SNP in the in another mouse strain or another mouse stock, then this primer is thrown off the genomic DNA and the test doesn't work. So that's how those 48 markers are not in there. So then we have the uh, outbred stocks that we have here at Taconic, which is ICR, NMRI, Swiss Webster. Here is another population that is germ-free Swiss Webster. They have been isolated for some time in, in our breeding colonies. Here is NMRI nude and Swiss nude. So these are all pure Swiss backgrounds. The, Swiss mut uh, the nude mutation came up on a Swiss background, so therefore these are all Swiss pure uh, mice. Then we have the black Swiss, that is a non-agouti mutation crossed back from the B6 into Swiss Webster mice. We have ICR skid with the skid mutation, and then a couple of other nude mice that are outbred, but that have a significant uh, influence from BELPC. If we look now at the H Zero is the uh, heterozygosity that the stocks have now, and that varies from 0.158 all the way down to 0.06. And then, of course, we can ask what happened here. Well, there, oh, apparently there was a population bottleneck when the black uh, mutate uh, black was. Uh, back into the Swiss Webster background. And 
nobody seemingly cared about that bottleneck very much because black Swiss mice are only used for these breeding uh, purposes, so as foster mothers, for example, and not for any research where a big genetic variability would be needed. And we see also that the skit, outbred skits have a higher heterozygosity than the outbred nudes. And if we look at the polymorphisms here, then we get this, the number of polymorphisms within that population, meaning that a gene can be A in one mouse and C in the other mouse. The number of those alleles out of these 1,401 that worked is 667 in the best case and only 24 in the black Swiss. Now, one can also make a calculation of what is this equivalent to in terms of population bottlenecks or in terms of uh, population size. So there are two possibilities, of course. One is you have a small but constant population. For example, you go on breeding the animals once once they arrived from Switzerland, you bred them all the time with a population of 100 mice. Or you could have had a population bottleneck where there was inbreeding for n generations, brother sister inbreeding for n generations, and then it's expanded, the population expands again to an infinite population size. So maybe the Generations of inbreeding and then infinite population size is the more realistic parameter to look at. And that is the Swiss Webster population had only has only had a decrease in um, genetic variability that is equivalent to two generations of inbreeding and then expansion to infinite population size, whereas the black Swiss are more than halfway to an inbred strain with 14 generations of inbreeding. Now, one should also remember that some amount of loss of genetic variability is uh, unavoidable if you have an outbred population that is not of infinite size. Or you can also take this, these numbers as a hint of what size of population would you need to maintain if you want to go on in the same fashion. So if you receive a large shipment of Swiss Websters and you want to maintain the genetic variability, the heterozygosity, just the way it has been over the last uh, 60 years or so, then you would need a population of about 227, well, over 200 mice to, to do that. So that means it's uh, difficult to and expensive to maintain a population of outbred mice because you need large population sizes. And the more heterozygous, the more polymorphic the stock is, the more breeding pairs you need. So then the next thing I wanted to talk about is outbred rats. So we did a similar study in rats as well. We The outbred rats that are used in laboratories as the inbred rats as well are all derived from the Rattus norvegicus. <coughs> they have been in use for uh, lab studies actually longer than the outbred mice, and lo longer than all mice. The, uh, the origin is more diverse. The outbred rats are not derived from one small defined population as the Swiss mice were. Generally, there are fewer genetic polymorphisms known because the mouse has been the mammalian genetics 
workhorse and not the rat. Therefore, we needed to develop some test panels first. And uh, so I w on this slide, I want to go a little bit deeper into what the history of the rats is. So it all began with poodle pets, basically. Rats were the first lab animals that started in 1828. The first mutations that the rats have, so like white rat or black or dilute coat color or the, the other mutations like the spots of the long Evans rat, uh, originated from rats that were bred for a bloody show rat baiting, where they had dogs attack rats and try and the dogs were supposed to kill as many rats as possible in in as short a time as possible. So that's a pretty brutal thing and of course this is not done today anymore. Many in the main stocks developed slightly earlier than mouse strains and stocks that started in 1906 with Wister rats. Contrary to Swiss mice, there's no common origin of the main rat stocks. And all rats originate from a single uniform species, Rattus norwegicus, not a set of closely related species and subspecies like is the case in mice. So here is a, a phylogenetic tree, a genetic relationships of all the rat stocks and strains. And this is based on a paper by Kyoto University microsatellite data. So this is already, this has been tested with a different technology than we used for the SNPs. The NIH R NUD is an intercross of eight strains, and we had two cesarean rederivations at Taconic. And then, so therefore, this is not shown on this because it originated from several different ones. And then we have the strains on this diagram, Wister, which is the Wister Hanover and Wister Kyoto. SHR is the spontaneously hypertensive rat. SD is Sprague Dorley. This is Goto Kakazaki. Dilute Aguti, dar no, Dark Aguti Lewis rat. Fisher 344 and Long Evans. So the to for technology for this, we use the same technology as in the MOSS study. And this is SNPs. However, we had to design custom panels because there was no off-the-shelf panel available. Sample sizes are similar. More than 20 animals from each unit were tested. We, design, we used the following methods when we designed and did this. We searched public databases for information on polymorphisms. Then we also searched some databases on non-synonymous single nucleotide polymorphisms that would be meaningful mutations, mutations that change the protein sequence, for example, the amino acid sequence in a protein. We constructed five 144 SNP panels, custom, using the same Illumina technology as before. We used 20 samples from each stock and two samples from each inbred strain, and then tested each sample with 720 SNPs. We excluded failed and also non-informative markers, meaning if, the, if any marker was the same for all uh, these tested samples, and we did not include it. And we calculated heterozygosity and polymorphic markers. The estimate of heterozygosity in founder population, and therefore the effective population size and population bottlenecks, was not possible because too little is known about historical origins. Population genetics parameters were, as already said, the heterozygosity, which is explained here again. If you have AA, AB, AB, and BB genotypes, the heterozygosity is 0 0.5, and now you do this over all 720 markers tested, and 
average it. And the other parameters used is number of polymorphisms. And linkage and haplotypes were not tested. So here's the results for the rats. We looked at SHR and found that even though this is bred as in an outbred fashion, it's a rotational breeding uh, scheme, we still have zero heterozygosity, zero polymorphisms. That mean, and that is related to the fact that this has been inbred about 20 years ago and seemingly this inbreeding was enough to make it a completely inbred strain. Although there may be some uh, mutations, some heterozygosity, some heterozygous genes hidden somewhere in the genome that we didn't find because the experience has been that they breed better if you use an outbred rotational breeding scheme. And that means that there must be something there in the genome of those rats that is works better if there is a slight, a tiny amount of heterozygosity somewhere. Then we have two uh, selected population, diet resistant and diet sensitive rats that come out of a uh, SD population, and it's a different SD population than this one. And the diet resistant and diet sensitive rats, so the diet sensitive rat gains a lot of weight if you feed a high fat diet and the diet resistant one that does not. Those have around 350 polymorphisms and around uh, 0.2 in heterozygosity. And the long Evans rat has 0.119. The NHR nude is actually has actually a very low heterozygosity, so there must have been a bottleneck in breeding this when the nude mutation was put onto this background. Then Sprague Dolly is here has a 0.18, also relatively high. Uh, heterozygosity, the Spragdoli germ-free rats have only slightly less, so they are not as much separated from the Spragdoli as the Swiss Webster germ-free are from Swiss Webster mice. Then we have Worcester Hanover and Worcester, and Worcester Kyoto, which both, both have about 0.17. So here we see See, the most rat stocks studied have a high heterozygosity, which is DR, DS, WH, and Sprague Dolly. And uh, Sprague Dolly rats are best suited for phenotype selection experiments due to the high heterozygosity. There was little loss of genetic diversity during the selection for the diet induced obesity or diet sensitive DS and diet resistant DR phenotypes. <coughs> Excuse me. Special purpose stocks such as NIHR nude, the nude rat, have lower heterozygosity due to population bottlenecks that occurred when the mutation was introduced. And SHR, spontaneously hypertensive rat, is an inbred strain that is bred in rotational breeding setup. There were no polymorphisms detected in that strain. So after uh, telling about the genetic data that we got with our outbred stocks, I wanted to give some recommendations for working with outbreds. So if you work with outbreds, you should keep population size as large as possible. And that means that if you really want to maintain, long-term maintain an outbred population, you need a 100 cages or more and put that into a rotational breeding scheme. Then for medium-term projects such as phenotype selection, I think that uh, 32 cages per group may be a good compromise. That would be eight groups of four cages. The number of males should be equal to females, and you use a rotational breeding method. 
if there is a population bottleneck for any reason, then you have to re-expand the population as quickly as possible after that uh, population bottleneck because that, may, that then rescues your heterozygosity. If you go on, if you extend the population bottleneck over time, then heterozygosity, the polymorphisms in the genome are quickly lost. If there's a lack of space, however, then you're better off not breeding, but obtaining the uh, rats or mice commercially. So for rotational breeding, I wanted to show a little bit how that works. So you populate, uh, divide the population in n groups of any number of cages. So you can, for example, have uh, four groups uh, that each have 100 cages, or you can have four groups that have only one cage each. Of course, if it's only one cage each, then uh, you lose quite a bit of genetic polymer uh, heterozygosity over time. At each setup, you take males from group X and females from group Y to form the new group Z. The parents of the pups are, in the worst case, if you have a four uh, rotational breeding scheme with four groups. Parents of the pups are, in the worst case, one cage per group, second cousins. Of course, if you have four groups of 100 cages each, then the probability that the uh, parents are second cousins is reduced at least a hundredfold, uh, so more likely they are much less related than that. So and this is how it works. So you have the you take a male from the old breeding group one, and if uh, no, you take a male from the old breeding group two and a female from the old breeding group one, uh, to form the new group breeding group one. So that means a new pup in unit one is has the mother from the old one and the father from the old two, then the father from the father here who used to be in from group two has his parents from the yet one generation older group three and four, and then this comes from one and two, this from three and four, and so on. And this in this setup, all the breeding groups are perfectly balanced, and the Animals cannot be more related than second cousins. Of course, you could also make a similar breeding scheme that is for eight groups or so. If you have a number of groups that not that's not two to the n, then you get a slightly less balanced setup in the end. Because of if you have five breeding groups, of course, then as you have only eight grandparents, then you have slightly unbalanced representation of the breeding groups. But that, uh, that averages out in the long term, of course. So, there, of course, now if you want to have a population that is not completely homozygous, is not completely inbred, there's not only outbred populations that you can work with, but you can also control genetic diversity and heterozygosity in other ways. For example, you can use strain hybrids. If you cross two inbred strains, then the F1 is 100% heterozygous. So the F1 has an unnaturally high heterozygosity. Because normally the in any population that is in equilibrium, you would you cannot have all animals heterozygous because if you cross two heterozygous animals then in the next generation you have some uh animals that are homozygous for some alleles. So you can can make a set of interstrain F ones that simulates an outbred population. The disadvantage of that is that it's not really, mix, really mixed up in terms of chromosome segments, and certain gene combinations don't occur. 
So for that, you would need either a lot of different strains, uh, strain combinations then to do that. But generally, it's a good approach if you want to just have some increased heterozygosity. So if you use transgenes, you can continuously backcross it the transgenic line to F1 hybrids. The result is then a line that has the transgene and the same overall allele percentage as an F2 of those G strains. So you then get of any gene that is different between the two strains that it originally came from, that the hybrids came from. Uh, so if you, for example, have um, A and B in there, then there will be one quarter AA homozygotes, one quarter BB uh, homozygotes, and one half of them will be heterozygous. So one example that we where we use this at Taconic is Taconic's APP Swedish mutation transgene. And that's the main line is on a B6SJL uh, background. So it's the it means the transgene carriers are continuously back crossed to B6SJL F1 hybrids. The reason why we do that is that the transgene is lethal on the B6 genetic background. So yeah, so at the end I wanted to thank the collaborators again and open the talk for questions. Thank you, Dr. Porter, for this interesting presentation. Uh, I heard something new today about the bloody show, and um, I must say I'm I'm glad this kind of entertainment is abandoned now. So so thanks for sharing that with us. So um, so I'll start. Um, we'll start the questions and answer sessions now. So um, so here is the first question for you, Dr. Bodes. Um The question is: What is the minimum number of breeding pairs to maintain an outbred stock? So the minimum number. Yes, so this is a trade-off, of course, a trade-off between cost and effort and the uh, uh, speed at which you lose the heterozygosity. So there is no minimum number, basically, because in any population mm -hmm. you lose some polymorphisms through genetic drift. Only the larger the population, it, the less likely it is to lose. Uh, heterozygosity. And that's the reason why uh, in in conservation, when you look at endangered species, usually people are only really um, happy if the population of the endangered species increases back up over 1,000. Of course, 1,000 is not realistic for any uh, for most outbred colonies. So therefore, I was saying, well, we have a good, we ha have a good compromise in saying that for long-term maintenance, you would need at least 100 breeding pairs, which is about the, the effective population size that the Swiss Webster, for example, has uh, had over the last 50 years. Or if you have a shorter term experiment, you would say, how about 32 cages? So that is and the shorter the mm -hmm. time frame that you want to maintain an outbred stock, the less cages you need. You always okay. should use a rotational breeding scheme to maximize your resources and minimize mm -hmm. the loss of mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, there is another question here. Does it matter if I use breeding trios, so one male with two females? Yeah, so that is better, of course, in terms of producing more mice or more rats. Usually trios are used for mice, not for rats. Uh, but it doesn't mm -hmm. give you much more effective population size because the males, if there are fewer males than females, then the Males, so to say, act as the population bottleneck. 
Uh, so so it right. mm -hmm. increases the effective population size and therefore doesn't reduce the loss of heterozygosity as much as if you would just eat an, add another breeding pair to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question here, and um, it is, can you talk a bit more about um, the transfer of a trans gene to an outbred stock, how, how that's done? Yeah, so that's um, a very expensive proposition, because if you really want to transfer a trans gene to an outbred stock, meaning that the new stock is identical to, say, your Swiss Webster mice, only that it now carries the trans gene, then you have to back cross for 10 generations into the outbred population. That means you have, you set up eight breeding, eight breeding groups, for example. You put, and into each breeding group, you put a male transgenic carrier and a female from the outbred population, breed them. Then in the next generation, you again populate your eight breeding groups with a male carrier and eight new and and the females from the breeding groups of the Swiss Webster mouse population and so on. So you have to back cross it into a large outbred population. And that means you have at least eight times the effort of back crossing that you would have in the in the case where you have an inbred. Strain. And therefore, mm -hmm. many people, if they want to have something that is more genetically diverse, then it would probably be more efficient to use this back crossing to F1 mice that I described in the other case. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is another question here from, from Jody. So the question is, uh, what if I have a small colony that is about 30 cages? But introduce new breeders, five of each sex, to set up with my colony animals from a commercial source on a regular base, let us say every six months, in addition to doing the rotational breeding that you described. So what influence would that have on the, on the so colony? So that would very effectively maintain the heterozygosity, because now you have a gene mm -hmm. flow, and a gene flow, even of a few animals every generation, will introduce, uh, will, will maintain the heterozygosity quite effectively. So if you uh, refresh your population every, uh, say, even every other generation with a number, with say a number, uh, with a number of breeding pairs from the commercial supplier, then through that refreshing, you are sort of linked to the a uh, big population that the commercial supplier has. Mm -hmm. And that keeps them pretty well synchronized. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Of, yeah, um, of, is, yeah. Uh, there is a, there's a formula for that too in population genetics, so one could go into details how much <laughs> heterozygosity you lose if you migrate this and that many animals every generation. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can come back if 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 more uh, um, details are are uh, requested by Jodi. You can uh, you can uh, communicate via email after after the webinar. Yeah. Um. One more, maybe one final question here is, um, how do you run a selection experiment where you select, for example, for high alcohol consumption? Yeah. So that's the experiment that I also mentioned in the in the talk and you have to do that using again pretty large colonies because if you have if the colonies are too small that you use for selection then you get some random genetic drift that means in the two selected populations not only the genes of interest accumulate the genes that, for example, dominate alcohol consumption, but also the random genes go into that selected population. And to avoid mm -hmm. that, as I said, you would need, it, I'd say, at least 32 cages if I want to make it uh, 
two to the nth power thing or 64 or something like this. So it has to be a large population to do that. Mm -hmm. Then you, and then in each, so from your original outbred stock that is, say, a couple of hundred animals, you choose the, the 30 or so that are, that are, are at the ends of the distribution. And you use them to breed a new, to breed two population, one, one drinkers and one non-drinkers population, for example. And then you increase that again and again uh, select the extremes of the distribution and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of cages that you need, yes. Okay. So maybe one final question here um, just came in. So how different are the Swiss Webster stocks between different mouth facilities? I think that different vendors like Charles River versus Taconic versus Jax, have they all maintained equal heterozygosity? Or are there differences due to bottlenecks specific to the establishment of that stock at that uh, respective facility? So how do yeah. those stocks compare? Oh, yeah. So... As far as I know, Jackson Lab doesn't have outbred stocks, if I remember that correctly. I think mm -hmm. they only have inbred mice, and then they and then they have this diversity outbred, which is another, which is another method that they used to create an outbred stock because that's an outbred stock that's created from, originally from crossing inbred mice, so re you recreate. Mm -hmm genetic diversity. But for the other vendors, I would expect that they all have equal popu effective population sizes, but we didn't do the experiment. We didn't look into how exactly are these populations differently, different. They will be different because if you have populations that are separate, separated for 100 or 200 generations, then there will be random genetic drift. That means that in that population, some alleles will become less common, some alleles will become more common just by random processes. And mm -hmm. so they will be slightly different. Okay. So I think with this, we'll... Um We'll end the questions and answers session and this webinar. Thank you again, Dr. Boto, for the interesting presentation. Thank you, everybody, for attending, for your interest. Um, you can still ask, of course, if there are more questions coming up after the webinar, you can ask Dr. Boto after this webinar still by, by email. Um, we hope you enjoyed the presentation and uh, maybe you got some ideas how to breed uh, outbred stocks in, in your own facility. And uh, we also hope that uh, we'll be able to welcome you again at the one of our next webinars. So please have a look on our webpage. Um, we'll have uh, more webinars coming up. And um, yeah, hope to welcome you again. And uh, thank you for today. And bye-bye.